let's move to another speaker. Uh, uh, Yasin Ali uh, Heymoud. Uh, and the title of the talk is A Problem Interacting Dark Matter and the Creating Primordial Black Holes with the CMB. I, thank you for the invitation. I reduced the title on the on the slide okay. just to be a bit okay. shorter. I will be curious though to, I was just looking, I mean, the gun and remain bound is very easy to just look up now. <laughs> Maybe at the end we can, we, can, we can go back to it. So thank you very much for inviting me. I'm sorry this uh, didn't happen last year. Uh, let me set up everything. Do you see my slides? Everything works yes. well? Okay, good. Yes. All right, so uh, we've heard a lot about dark matter. Uh, the dark matter manifests itself across a very, very broad range of systems and scales, but by far the most accurate, the most precise measurement we have of its abundance is from CMB anisotropy, temperature and polarization power spectra, as illustrated in this figure. If you try to fit the blue data points here from Planck uh, by you know, reducing the dark matter to zero, you cannot even run the code. Like I asked someone who does this kind of fits, like it's just gonna break down. Okay, you need to have uh, about five times as much dark matter as you have baryons, and this number is actually measured to a percent precision. So of course, the million dollar question is, what the hell is dark matter made of? We've heard talks about primordial black holes, talks about particle-like dark matter, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about both in this talk. The common thread will be the uh, possible electromagnetic interactions that dark matter candidates may have, this very feeble electromagnetic interactions, just to not use the word weak, which could have different meanings. So for example, dark matter, if it's a particle that could annihilate with itself or it's antiparticle uh, into photons or leptons or quarks, or it could decay in, into these particles. Dark matter, if it's a, again, some form of microscopic or even uh, composite particle, could uh, scatter elastically with standard model particles, uh, in particular with photons or electrons and nuclei. This is the kind of stuff that people look for in direct detection experiments. I'm gonna tell you how you could look for it into, uh, with the CMB as well. And another completely different kind of dark matter candidate is primordial black holes. And they could also lead to effectively have electromagnetic interactions in the form of injecting uh, electromagnetically interacting particles into the plasma in the early universe if these black holes evaporate or accrete. And I will be talking about accreting primordial black holes very uh, briefly. Okay, so let me start by defining the jargon. I'm gonna talk about a couple different aspects of the CMB. So the CMB is just some radiation uh, of which we can measure the specific intensity as a function of frequency or photon energy and direction in the sky, okay? We can always define some T function uh, in one-to-one. -one. This is a one-to-one -one function, which in principle depends on frequency and direction in the sky. Now, if this function is a constant, this means that the CMB has a perfect black body spectrum, which is independent of direction. This is the CMB monopole measured to be 2.73 uh, with 10 minus four accuracy by FIRAS. If this function T is the same in all directions in the sky, but does have a frequency dependence, that means that the CMB spectrum is not actually a black body spectrum. It's, it's a homo, it's isotropic, but it's not a black body spectrum. And this delta T, uh, I, it's called spectral distortions. Okay? Spectral distortions in the CMB. And then if this function T does not depend on frequency, so we truly have a black body spectrum, but with possibly different temperatures in every direction, this is what we refer to as anisotropies. And lastly, you can have some perturbations which depend both on frequency and on direction in the sky. And an example of this is uh, the sunyaev zadovich uh, effect. And I'm not gonna talk about this. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about spectral distortions, purely isotropic perturbations, but frequency dependent perturbations to the black body spectrum and anisotropies. The outline will be that I will start with the spectral distortions, briefly, briefly review the underlying physics and tell you how one can use current upper limits and how can one forecast the sensitivity of future experiments to specifically a dark matter particle, which may be elastically scattering with uh, photons or electrons or nuclei. Then in the second part, I will tell you very, again, briefly review the underlying physics underlying CMB anisotropies. And I will tell you how one can test, for example, 
uh, accreting power module black holes and look for, you know, set upper limits or perhaps look for accreting power module black holes through CMB and SLTROPIS. So that's the plan and let's start with uh, spectral distortions. So the basic setup is as follows. So at very high redshift, redshift greater than about 2 million corresponding to time after the Big Bang, uh, le less than about two months after the Big Bang, photons interact, uh, can, can, ver can be very easily created and destroyed through interactions uh, with thermal processes, with a, with a thermal plasma. So for example, through double Compton scattering and a Bremsschirl. So photon number is not conserved and this non-conserving, non-number conserving interaction takes place through interactions with thermalized processes. So no matter what energy might be injected into the plasma at redshifts greater than about 2 million, this energy will be very quickly thermalized and the CMB spectrum will, uh, obtain, will retain a black body uh, spectrum, even though it might be with a slightly different temperature. So basically whatever happens at redshift greater than 2 million stays, I mean, is forgotten as far as spectral distortions like are concerned. Now you could, of course, uh, have some consequences for big bang nucleosynthesis. At redshift less than about 2 million, photon number is no longer conserved. Okay? Uh, photon energy can be easily changed by Thompson scattering down to redshift about 60,000, but eventually even photon energy is no, is, uh, no longer easily changed. So what that means is that if you inject some kind of energy into the plasma, this will, in general, distort the uh, black body spectrum, or distort the, the CMB spectrum away from a perfect black body spectrum. The specific shape of the distortion will depend on exactly when you inject the energy and on which form you inject the energy. If you inject it earlier than this 60,000 redshift, then you will have a universal chemical potential distortion, but if it's later on, then it's no longer a universal distortion. But the bottom line and the important thing to, to know if you want to make any estimates is that the fractional distortion to the CMB spectrum is of order, and really with a number here of order unity, the integral over time of the energy injected per unit time per unit volume normalized to the energy density of uh, CMB photons. Okay, so this is basically the fractional total energy injected into the plasma at redshifts less than about 2 million. This tells you the magnitude, the, uh, fr the relative amplitude of the distortion. So the current status of measurements of the frequency spectrum of the CMB, well, is hasn't changed since Kobe firas So uh, in the 90s, FIRAS measured this, the spectrum of the CMB over a broad range of frequencies and found that the CMB is consistent with the perfect black body to within 10 to the minus four, okay, relative distortions. And this can be expressed in, to, in terms of this chemical potential or this sunyev zeldovich compton y parameter. But the bottom line is that the CMB is a perfect black body spectrum to within 10 minus four. This is the current state of the art uh, measurement. Now there's a big push in the community to uh, try and perhaps build the next generation spectral distortion experiments. Uh, and it turns out actually just uh, last week, we got we heard from Jacques de Labrouille, who's been along with Jens Klubat, they've been leading this push for spectral distortions, and that ESA has selected spectral distortion measurements as one of the important missions to be, you know, uh, pursued in 2035 to 2050. Okay, so keep this in mind. So, with this, let's now see how one can constrain or test uh, dark matter through spectral distortions. So let me first start briefly by pointing out that you can, in principle, look for annihilating dark matter through spectral distortion, because obviously this will inject energy into the photon baryon plasma if dark matter annihilates. But the, if you have an S-wave annihilation, the uh, spectral distortions are much less con constraining than CMB anisotropies, which I will briefly discuss later. So here, I'm not gonna talk about dark matter annihilation constraints, but rather about something that's less immediately intuitive which is uh, the fact that if dark matter can elastically scatter with baryons or photons, then this can lead to uh, spectral distortion in the scene. So the basic idea we pointed out uh, a few years ago now with, uh, in a paper with Jens Kluber and Mark Mankowski and is as follows. So suppose you start with a non-relativistic particle, dark matter particle, a redshift uh, 2 million. And for this to be true, the dark matter mass needs to be heavier than about a couple hundred electron volts. So if 
the dark matter was to evolve adiabatically. Let me close my window, it's a bit noisy. All right. So if the dark matter temperature would evolve adiabatically, being non-relativistic, its temperature would go as one over A squared. So T chi dot would go as minus two H T chi. On the other hand, the photon baryon plasma evolves according to temperature goes as one over A. So T gamma dot goes as minus H T gamma. Now imagine that you put these two uh, dark matter and photons or electrons or protons that they scatter with one another. Uh, then there will be some heat exchange between dark matter and the photon baryon plasma. If the cross section is large enough, the dark matter will start, and depending on the details, if you have a, essentially a cross section which depends, say, with the positive power law on velocity or energy, the dark matter will start thermally coupled uh, at early times. And at some point, at some redshift, the coupling redshift will fall out of the equilibrium uh, with. The, for, with the plasma. So the actual temperature of dark matter will be uh, equal, very closely coupled to the photon or the plasma temperature down to a decoupling redshift, C decoupling. So this means that the photon baryon plasma is constantly heating up dark matter and in turn, dark matter is constantly taking away heat from the photon baryon plasma. And the net rate of energy injection is just three halves of the number density of dark matter particle times the, times the difference between the actual evolution of the temperature minus what it would do if it was adiabatic. Okay, I'm just saying this energy density is three halves of N, N times T and the heating rate just comes from this uh, difference between the actual and adiabatic evolution. So if you rewrite this in terms of the dark matter density, you see that this is inversely proportional to the dark matter mass. Okay, if the dark matter makes, if this particle makes all of the dark matter. And then if you plug back this into your integral, what you find, and if this holds, if this approximation holds as long as uh, the dark matter is in tight thermal equilibrium with the plasma, what you're going to find is that the fractional spectral distortion is basically of order the ratio of the number density of dark matter particle which is inversely proportional to its mass, to the number density of photons, which is a constant independent of time, times some log of redshift 2 million over the decoupling redshift. Okay, so this, of course, works only if the decoupling redshift is uh, late enough. Otherwise, you get, through this approximation, no spectral distortion at all. So to find this decoupling redshift is what depends on the actual microphysical parameters of dark matter, namely the cross-section, uh, elastic scattering cross-section with baryons or photons or electrons. So by solving for Z decoupling in terms of the cross-section, you can figure out what is the spectral distortion as a function of the cross-section. And then you can turn this around given upper limit from FIRAS or given some forecasted sensitivity to future uh, spectral distortion experiments, you can set some upper limit or some sensitivity experiments to the dark matter cross-section with say protons, electrons, or photons as a function of the dark matter mass. And the key point here, as was pointed out to with, uh, by Malcolm in his uh, previous talk, so you can look for dark matter scattering with direct detection experiments, but for masses which are too light, so if you look for dark matter proton scattering, for masses which are below a GeV, you lose sensitivity because the dark matter loses. Uh, it doesn't have enough kinetic energy to excite, to you know, generate a signal in your detector. And for electrons, you can push dark matter scattering with electrons, you can push down to about an MeV. But so this uh, probe here is more sensitive at low masses. And even though it's not a you know, really tight sensitivity, it still probes the mass range, which is complementing those are spectral dis um, direct detection experiments. Now, this was the very basic idea, and it turns out uh, this instantaneous decoupling approximation, uh, which we thought, you know, it makes sense as a first step. Even though we wrote the full equations, we just did the simple approximation. It makes everything analytic. It can actually be very, very, very inaccurate. And the reason is that, so this is some dimensionless cooling rate. If you assume this instantaneous decoupling approximation, Basically, you say dark matter is perfectly coupled, and then boom, it's completely decoupled. It doesn't exchange any heat anymore. And if you look at some light enough dark matter particles with a small enough cross section, in this approximation, it would decouple before this redshift of 2 million. But if you actually follow its heat exchange rate, if you actually solve for its temperature evolution, then you see that there's a residual heat exchange even after the, the dark matter has officially decoupled from the plasma. 
And if the dark matter is light enough, this can give rise here to a significant spectral distortion. So this is showing this chemical potential distortion for as an example for as a function of the dark matter proton cross section. As you crank it up, if you do the instantaneous decoupling approximation, you're gonna have nothing at all for low cross sections, and then you're gonna have some step function basically. But in reality, you have this uh, this uh, small cross section uh, contribution to the chemical potential. So turning this around, the basic point is that the at low dark matter masses, you can actually probe much weaker dark matter in cross sections, dark matter elastic scattering cross sections with protons, electrons, and photons, than what we had, uh, you know, estimated in this very first work. So I re-evaluated the constraints and the forecasts from FIRAS and the forecast from some potential future spectral distortion experiments on the dark matter cross section with protons, electrons as a function of dark matter mass for different uh, parameterizations of the cross section. And this is just showing you, uh, if we focus, for example, on this dark matter electron cross section, there are not so many existing uh, constraints on dark matter electron elastic scattering. And again, to emphasize this point that direct detection experiments probe very low cross sections, but they are limited to high masses. So this spectral distortion probe is complementing these direct detection experiments uh, in the low mass range. And you can, as a more realistic uh, dark matter uh, model, if you look at say a specific, uh, uh, so a dark matter with, for example, an electric or magnetic dipole moment, you can simultaneously predict all the cross sections for annihilation into photons, leptons, quarks, and the scattering cross section with photons, electrons, nuclei, and I've written a code to account for all of those cross sections and predict the spectral distortion generated uh, by um, the, these interactions as a function of dark matter mass. And so for example, for the electric dipole moment, this is, these are the limits that you get on the electric dipole moment as a function of dark matter mass. And you see that even though they can be stronger in any given mass range that some of the constraints they are actually weaker than the best constraints existing in any mass range. And even for futuristic experiments, we will not be able to beat the existing constraints, be they from direct detection or be by nucleosynthesis constraints, or this is uh, some stellar cooling constraints. So for this specific example of dark matter with an electric dipole moment, spe spectral distortions are not going to tell us anything more than what we already know. They're not gonna be able to set tighter constraints, but again, this is just one specific example. And in general, this is one you know, tool to keep in mind, one uh, possible constraint to keep in mind that you can actually uh, say something about dark matter interactions through spectral distortions. And you can use this code if you are interested in this. So let me move on to the second part of the talk, unless we wanna take questions first. I don't know how you wanna do this. I can keep the questions for the end or I can, this is gonna be a different part of the talk. Okay, I'll move on and then if you have questions, if anyone has been listening in the void of Zoom. Let's talk about CMB and isotropies now. This is gonna be also about primordial black holes. So just a very brief review of the physics of CMB isotropies, the protagonists of the story. We have baryons, i.e. electrons, protons, helium nuclei, photons, you know, billion, several billion photons per baryons, neutrinos, and dark matter. As far as the zeroth order CMB and isotropy are concerned, all we need to know about dark matter here is that it's collisionless, okay, for the zeroth order, and we're gonna, you know, add some more than zeroth order corrections. So all of those are uh, interacting, or rather non-interacting, in the curved space-time through gravity. And the one interaction that is present for the first 400,000 years, and which is very important, is Thomson scattering between baryons and foot, and between photons and free electrons, which maintains photons and baryons in tight equilibrium for the first 400,000 years. So how does one very schematically extract, uh, you know, predict CMB temperature and polarization isotropies? You start with some Gaussian initial perturbations, parameterized by whatever is your favorite uh, a prediction from inflation. You then solve the linearized 
coupled equations for dark matter baryons, photons, and neutrinos. So you're solving Boltzmann equations, fluid equations, and the Einstein Poisson equations. Okay. So for cold dark matter, this is really just the relativistic generalization of these equations, the continuity and momentum equation for dark matter. And for baryons and photons, what you get are these uh, acoustic oscillations because photons and baryons are tightly coupled and photons give a large pressure to uh, this photon baryon plasma, okay? So then what are we actually seeing in CMB anisotropies? So photons, as I was saying, are tightly coupled to baryons for a while. So the photons scatter very frequently with free electrons up until about 400,000 years, the last scattering epoch when photons scatter for the last time. These photons then, climb uphill in the expanding universe, travel through cosmological distances. And this is what we see today as the cosmic microwave background, okay? So what we see today as the CMB is the imprint basically of the last oscillation of this photon baryon plasma imprinted on the moment on the surface where photons have scattered for the last time, okay? Roughly speaking. So the key point here that I wanna make is that this process of how exactly did the universe go from ionized to neutral as the temperature goes down, as the density goes down, which is cosmological recombination. This is a very crucial process to CMB and isotropies. And so more, quant more, more quantitatively, what we're interested in is the free electron fraction as a function of time or as a function of redshift, which goes from 1.16 because it's normalized to number density of hydrogen and there are eight helium atoms per uh, 100 hydrogen atoms and they each carry two electrons. So it goes from 1.16 to 1.08 to one and then to zero. So just to give you a visual sense of how sensitive CMB anisotropies are to the ionization history, here the three plots here show the CMB temperature and polarization power spectra that are actually you know, used in measurements to extract cosmological parameters. And here I'm showing the ionization fraction. The curve here is the standard ionization fraction. I'm gonna add a little bump, a 10% bump. It's a huge bump, as you will see the effect. And I'm gonna just move this bump in time. So this is not a physical model. All I'm showing you here is basically a Green's function response of temperature and polarization power spectra to the ionization, to changes in the ionization history, okay? And so what is, this is showing you is that you have a very sensitive, even for a 10% bump in the free electron fraction, especially as the free electron fraction, this bump crosses the moment of last scattering, you have a huge sensitivity of CMB temperature and polarization and isotropies to the recombination history. So to say anything about in general cosmological parameters, you need to have a very, very precise and very accurate um, theoretical understanding of recombination. And we will see that moreover, we can use this under this understanding of standard recombination to say what happens if we then perturb recombination. So the standard recombination, this is something I worked on with Chris Serata during my thesis, and we produced this code HIREC. Jens Kluba also wrote the code COSMOREC. Those codes are accurate to about 10 minus four. They take about a second to run per cosmology, which it turns out was still too slow. And so uh, last year, my student Nanum Lee and I produced this new code, HIREC2, where we basically, uh, we compute some correction functions from HIREC for radiative transfer effects. And we still use some exact four level atom model to capture the uh, late time recombination. You can read all the details in the paper, but the bottom line is that we've tested that this code is as accurate as HIREC over a very broad range of cosmologies, basically the entire three sigma regime of Planck, it still gives you less than 10 minus four errors and it runs in one millisecond. So this is the fastest recombination code in the West and also uh, as accurate as the state of the art recombination codes. Okay, so with this knowledge of recombination to high precision, we can also test different dark matter uh, models with the CMB. So the first thing one can test, I'm just gonna briefly mention this. Uh, I haven't worked on this myself, but I wanna re-mention this for completeness. So if dark matter scatters, again, just like I was talking about before in the context of spectral distortion, if dark matter can elastically scatter with photons or, bear, or electrons or nuclei, then this will induce an additional momentum exchange term in the momentum exchange equation for dark matter. It will couple 
the fluid equations for dark matter and baryons besides just the coupling through gravity. Okay, so what is this gonna do pictorially? We're gonna add these arrows here between possibly dark matter and nuclei or photons or even neutrinos. So this in turn is going to change how the photon baryon uh, acoustic waves uh, evolve in time. Okay, so that's one effect that you can look for. And this has been looked at by many people to set and used to set constraints on the dark matter again, cross section with protons or, electro, or just protons actually so far. Um, and relatively to spectral distortions, this is better than fire ass, but spectral distortion measurements with uh, sensitivity of 10 minus nine or so could actually do better than these current uh, CMB and isotropy limits. But what I wanna focus on is uh, the effect rather on dark, on, of dark matter on the free electron fraction. So the standard uh, kind of effect you might be more familiar with is looking for dark matter annihilation in the CMB. So I'm gonna start with this and then tell you how we can use this similarly for primordial black holes. So the idea is what? Is that if dark matter can annihilate to any form of electromagnetically interacting particles. Okay, so this, is, this means it's going to inject some energy in the photon baryon plasma. And you can figure out exactly how much energy it, inter, it injects given the annihilation cross-section of dark matter and given the mass of the dark matter. And it's basically proportional to the dark matter mass density squared times the sigma V over mass of the dark matter. So this is the one parameter that is key here in this analysis. Then the key part is that this energy inject, injection is not deposited necessarily on the spot. So here I wrote DEDTDV injected and here it's DEDTDV deposited. So there's a whole industry. So Tracy Slatcher, for example, is someone who works a lot on how to compute this. And then this energy deposited itself will be deposited in the form of heat, excitation, and also additional ionizations. So in the recombination equations for the free electron fraction, you're gonna add a source term proportional to this annihilation cross-section. Okay, so what this does is that it will enhance the free electron fraction at late times, and this will lead to some changes in the CMB power spectra. So it's much more boring than the bump I showed you, but the, the qualitative effect is similar. And through this effect, you can set some upper limits. Currently, Planck has very tight upper limits on the sigma V over M chi parameter. Okay, or here is sigma V, which is proportional to M chi depending on what exactly the dark matter annihilates into, which is going to change the efficiency of the position. Okay, the same general picture holds if dark matter is made of something entirely different, namely primordial black holes, be they evaporating or accreting. So focusing on accreting primordial black holes. So the hard part of this calculation is to figure out A, how efficiently primordial black holes would accrete baryons. This is a very difficult calculation. So here we've made some, you know, very as simple, but hopefully um, conservative estimate of this accretion rate. And another very difficult part is to figure out their luminosity again, or their radiative efficiency epsilon. So different papers have different estimates and ours is the most conservative and try to be the most first principles yet conservative estimate of this luminosity. Okay, so this gives you some energy injection, which is proportional to the non abundance of primordial black holes, hence to their frac the fraction of dark matter in primordial black holes, times the luminosity of, of each black hole. Then again, the same process, part of this energy is going to then be deposited into the plasma, not necessarily immediately, but perhaps with some delay or perhaps you know, not deposited at all. And then this will in turn change the ionization history, the average ionization history of the plasma. So this is just to show you some of the steps of the calculation. So one of them is to compute the luminosity and just to illustrate here, even within our most conservative uh, estimate of the luminosity of accreting primordial black holes, we, we have two different uh, cases, depending on how the local accreted gas eventually gets ionized, be, be it through photoionizations or collision ionization, and you get two orders of magnitude difference. So it's a, just to illustrate that the uncertainties remain huge in this calculation. And this is showing an, another way uh, of the, to show the very large uncertainties. This is our conservative calculation of the luminosity. And these are some estimates uh, for disc accreting primordial black holes by Vivian Poulin and collaborators. So again, ours is the conservative 
uh, estimates. So then the idea is that this again changes the free electron fraction as a function of time, thus leads to perturbations to the CMB temperature and polarization power spectra. Here I'm just showing the temperature power spectra. And then you can turn this around and set, given the Planck data, you can set some upper limits on the fraction of primordial black holes, the fraction of dark matter made of primordial black holes as a function of mass. So this is here assuming a, that all primordial black holes have the same mass. Of course, this is a simplistic uh, assumption, but this calculation can be trivially generalized by having any mass function. You okay, just integrate over the mass. So the point is that quite robustly, one can rule out from CMB and isotropies, one can rule out primordial black holes of over hundred solar masses from being all of the dark matter. And this, these bounds could be improved if one were able to study the accretion physics and understand it extremely robustly, you know, beyond reasonable doubt. And then one could probably set much you know, tighter bounds. But for now, conservatively, given the uncertainties in accretion physics, I would say that this is the conservative bounds. Now, I don't, how, how much time do I have, uh, Dimitri? I don't know exactly uh, wanna, if I should keep the sprint or if I can slow down a bit. Well, actually, if it's uh, more or less towards the end of the year, yeah, but okay, <laughs> good, all right, perfect. So this is so this is going to just take me a couple, yeah, five minutes. You're the, you're the last, the last speaker of the of this uh, session, so you have more okay, time. all right. Anyway, mm -hmm. so so let me tell you about this. In the last is really like a couple of two slides. This is, I think, it's more interesting here. So I told you about this effect basically on the global ionization history. Okay. If dark matter annihilates or if primordial black holes accretes, you calculate the global enhancement to the ionization history. Now, what I want to point out is that accreting primordial black holes should be accreting in a very, very highly inhomogeneous way. So to understand this, if you just think of the simple Bondi accretion model, the accretion rate is going to be proportional to density times mass of the black hole squared over sound speed cubed. But if gas is moving supersonically with respect to the black holes, the Bondi accretion rate will be approximately suppressed by you know, one over sound speed squared plus uh, relative velocity of the gas squared to the three halves. In the simplest, uh, the simple model that we have for luminosity, if you assume free free radiation, which goes as the density of the gas squared, it turns out it's proportional to the accretion rate squared. So basically in the model that we have used in this 2017 paper with Mark Amiankowski, we assume this dependence of the luminosity on the sound speed and the relative motion of baryons with respect to primordial black holes. Those are large scale relative motions that I'm showing here. This is a realization of 300 by 300 megaparsecs. Those are linear motions on very large scales, which you can predict just from you know, your Boltzmann codes. And they happen to be supersonic as was pointed out by Tsilyakovic and Hirata in 2010. So what we do in this first paper is we, we had taken the average of this luminosity. That's why I was showing you these, I don't know it's not showing anymore. I was showing you this L average. It's computed the average of this luminosity over all relative velocities. Now the actual picture of what happens is that the luminosity is highly spatially varying. So regions like here in the blue, where they have small relative velocities, which happen to be subsonic, will have a very large luminosity. And then all the majority of the rest of the regions, which are supersonic, will be in this calm sea. Okay? So this average luminosity is really something like 1% of the volume times a huge uh, number gives you this average luminosity. So with this, why is it interesting? So if you have an inhomogeneous energy injection, first of all, this energy will be deposited itself inhomogeneous, inhomogeneously, unless it gets, you know, unless the photons get deposited at cosmological distances away from the um, emitter. This will then lead to an inhomogeneous recombination. And then when you have inhomogeneous recombination, you get CMB non gaussianities So, this would be a qualitatively different effect than just the change to the CMB power spectra that I've been discussing. So the first order of business, which we've tackled in this first paper, is to ask the first question. You have inhomogeneous energy injection, sure, but how far away do 
does the energy actually get deposited? The, do these inhomogeneities get washed out by the finite propagation of the uh, injected photons? This is something I looked at with my student, Trey Jensen. So the first step is to compute an injection to deposition Green's function. If I inject some energy at some uh, redshift or some scale factor and some location and with some photon energy, how does it later result in a deposition of this energy, okay? Uh, as a function of time and distance from the injection point. So this is, Trey has implemented some radiated transfer sim uh, simulation where he follows photons as they Compton scatter with the plasma and photoionize the gas as a function of time, as a function of distance from the injection point. So this is just to show you these greens function uh, as a function of, for different uh, redshifts of deposition and as a function of distance. And these are for two different photon energies. So they look very different depending on the energy of the photons that you inject. Because you know, Compton scattering is gonna be preferentially forward for high energy photons, et cetera, et cetera. Then the next step is to figure out given some energy deposition, it will affect recombination, but again, not instantaneously. So here there's no spatial aspect with the temporal aspect. So this is showing this temporal Green's function from deposition to ionization. And so by combining the two, you can find a Green's function from injection to recombination. And here I'm showing you in the Fourier domain. So the bottom line is that as a function of wave number, as time goes on, you have a suppression of the fluctuations of ionization at larger and larger scales, coming from the fact that, you know, photons that deposit their energy deposit further and further away from the injection point as time goes on. But the suppression is on scales of K of order 0.1 inverse megaparsec. So it's not completely washing out the original inhomogeneities. So this is our final, final prim preliminary results is my final slide here. So the point here is that, so in solids, in dash, I'm showing you the fractional change in the free electron fraction when you average out the luminosity of primordial black holes. And I'm showing you this uh, change when the abundance of primordial black holes saturates the current CMB anisotropy power spectral limit. In solid, I'm showing you the RMS fluctuation of the free electron fraction. And this is just showing that these are basically the same. Okay, so the picture that you have to keep in mind is that you have the standard free electron fraction. Then if you add primordial black holes, it will add some average background free electron fraction. But that what we show is that this additional thing that you add has order one fluctuations. And to give you an idea here, so here you see that this solid line is about 10 minus three. So again, the, the fluctuations in the free electron fraction are about 10 to minus three. Now in the standard, just standard vanilla lambda CDM, no annihilation, nothing. There are fluctuations in the free electron fraction just because uh, you know, for, from the, the nonlinear growth, the tiny nonlinear growth um, uh, the, um, of, uh, of, well, not even nonlinear growth of structure, but just because perturbations in the baryons will lead to perturbations in the free electron fraction. These perturbations of or, order 10 minus five or so, and that would lead to a non gaussianity parameter, an equivalent uh, of FNL of order one, okay? So here we have something that's a hundred times larger. So this is promising in terms of the possible non Gaussian signature. And moreover, these fluctuations are on scales of comparable to the CMB scale. So they get partially washed out. This is the difference between this black and these colored curves. So there's some partial washing out, but not a full washout. So the bottom, line is that uh, there is a qualitatively new effect that one can use for to look for uh, primordial black holes, which might be much, much more constraining than current constraints okay, from CMB power spectra. And this effect is inhomogeneous recombination, inhomogeneous accretion leads to inhomogeneous recombination, which leads to CMB non And So the next thing we're gonna look at is actually this, to quantify this, which is gonna be a, a uh, which is not an easy calculation. So I'll stop here. Sorry if I went over time. I'm not sure exactly uh, how over time I went, but thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any 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 questions? Uh, yes, Chris Kowaris, please. Yes. Um, so uh, thanks for the nice talk. Actually, um, I have a question uh, regarding this. Uh, 
uh, accretion uh, rates that you mentioned. So, so you said that uh, you're using some conservative accretion rates. Uh, so my question is like, uh, what kind of model you use for accretion? Because you can have spherical accretion bonded. I mean, that, that gives you a high rate. Uh, but then most of the time, black holes actually uh, accrete matter that has angular momentum, so they form a disk. And then it depends yeah. really on the disk, uh, uh, I don't know, like width and uh, size, etc. So, so I think it's quite sensitive to, to, uh, to the parameters of the disk. So how do you actually get this conservative accretion? Uh, rate? Absolutely. So, okay, so, so, the, so, so first the accretion rate, what I'm using is a generalized bondy. So it's a swimming spherical symmetry, and I'm going to tell you how I account for the for the non-spherical symmetry. So generalized Bondi in which way? In the sense that it's you have to. This is accretion in the early universe where the gas is accreting in a sea of photons, and these photons are not only going to prevent the gas from heating up because of Compton cooling in this case. So usually we think of Compton, you know, the Thomson scattering with photons and the the uh, the, the baryons in the early universe as maintaining the baryons hot down to redshift about 200. But here, the baryons want to accrete onto the black hole and so they're gonna to wanna to heat up. And so the, you have to account for the fact that the photons will try to actually maintain them, maintain them cold. That's a small uh, effect in the sense that it changes the accretion between uh, isothermal and adiabatic. So you, know, you have the, a factor of 10 in the accretion efficiency depending on these two cases. But more importantly, Early on in the universe, and this is why you have this suppression here, baryons as they try to accrete are going to, to feel a drag force, a wind you know, from photons. So they're trying to accrete, but they, they have this drag force from uh, the basically homogeneous photons through Thomson scattering. So we also account for this, which leads to suppression here. So it's not really bonded, it's bonded with some tweaks. Then we account, we try to account, and this is really kind of, uh, very approximate. This is uh, this is not easy to uh, account for. The fact again that you have these relative motions, so baryons accrete but with a supersonic wind. So here we just do the usual Bondi Hoyle trick, but you know that's very approximate. Then the luminosity, because this is at the end of the day what matters is the luminosity. The luminosity we estimate by trying to estimate the the temperature and density profile of the gas. You know of the accreted gas. And the assuming at minimum, at minimum, this gas is going to emit free free radiation when it gets uh, ionized, it's close enough to the black hole. And so then we, we estimate the free free uh, luminosity, which is similar to what uh, Shapiro did in 1973. Regarding the question about the disk, all these points are very important. And this is looked at in this paper uh, by Poulin and collaborators. So what they show here is that the, as you were pointing out, the the bondy, the naive bondy, which we go beyond this naive bondy, but the naive bondy is more by a factor of 10 or 100, depending on cases, more accretion than uh, what I my understanding is what is observed in some systems today, but this is not the systems, you know, at the early universe. But the radiative efficiency, if you have a disk, is many, many orders of magnitude more than the radiative efficiency that we have. So that's why this luminosity that we have is much less than what you would get if you took some typical parameters for an ADAF or something like this, like they do in this, um, in this paper. So that's why I think we're conservative. No, why is that? So, so, so you're saying that the accretion is lower, but luminosity is higher for, with the disk, right? Is this this what is what they say in this paper, yes, yeah. Okay. yeah. You know the reason yeah. for that? So, I mean, the accretion is lower, but not by much. You know, the accretion is like lower by 10. And, and again, this it's lower is based on some, as far as I understand it, some current day observations. The luminosity is higher for um, the for the, the disk because the, basically this epsilon, I have it here. So in for a disk, this epsilon is further like 0.1. For, a, uh, for this free free radiation, this epsilon is, extremely small, like 10 minus eight or something like this. I mean, it's really, 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 really much, much smaller. So for the disk, you really radiate an order, you know, tens of percent of the rest mass energy. But here we're really just radiating away some thermal energy. It's a small fraction of the rest mass energy. Thanks.
Can I ask a question? Oh, yes. So it's a naive, naive question, not connected to primordial black holes. And I'm, I'm sorry if it's a stupid question, but um, if you've got some uh, increase in um, ionization, at some redshift before the reionization due to stars, some small amount. Let's say you've got a bump and it could be at a redshift 200 or a redshift 100, but a long time after recombination. Mm -hmm. um, if you then look at the, um, the polarization spectrum, can you, tell, can you tell the redshift at which the ionization has been dumped into the plasma? So I haven't done this exercise quantitatively, but I think this is you know, sort of the pictorial answer to this uh, this question that you have, right? So, yeah, yeah, kind oh, of. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, this is like in time rather than redshift. It was yeah, no, it's okay. No. Uh, but so I think if it's really, I don't, so I don't have a quantitative answer. If it's really low redshift, of course, the, you will not be able to tell very much. You see like the asymptotes. So here you have some big changes, but yeah. eventually it just kind of all looks the same. It just is basically proportional to tau. Yeah. But so, yeah, I don't have a quantitative answer to your question. So when you say really I, low redshift, what do you mean when you, for you? So, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure if it's like 30. I don't know if it's, I don't know if you lose sensitivity below 200. I haven't done this exercise, yeah. All right, thank you very much, uh, thank you. Uh, like, I think it would be something, yeah, interesting to say, we could, we could you know, do some kind of principal component analysis and, and ask the uh, sensitivity to bumps in the free electron fraction at, low redshift and at, at, after which point am I just completely degenerate with tau basically. And I don't know the answer to this, yeah. Okay, Peter, Peter Tinikov, please. Hi, yes, and uh, thanks for uh, agreeing to join us and for giving a nice talk. Thank you for inviting me. I don't know if you have been here in, in the morning uh, uh, at the Dolgov talk where he proposed that uh, a sizable fraction of dark matter could be in, in anti-stars, huh? which have been created in the early universe. So this uh, anti-matter anti stars, they would have been then present at, uh, at the uh, recombination epoch. So do you, do you have any feeling on whether the, this is completely excluded by, uh, uh, the, because then, then it, they will, of course, annihilate with the with the surrounding baryons as much as they can, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. which will produce a radiation similar to the accretion of the black hole. So, do you have any feeling whether it will be uh, completely excluded or not? No, and I missed the talk because it was you know during the night for me, so unfortunately I couldn't <laughs> attend the morning session. Uh, but sort of uh, similar, yeah, no, similar size uh, of phenomenon as primordial black holes. Except yeah, no, no, I mean, it makes what you say makes bigger. something, yeah, you know, it, it, make, it makes sense. You're saying that it's an anti, so it's an antimatter star, right? Like yeah, regular, yeah, regular yeah. matter. So, yes, it will, it will first of all attract baryons just through gravity, and then there will be some annihilation. Absolutely, that makes completely sense to quantify it. I have no intuition on how, how big that would be. That's uh, and how you know how long it would take for the whole star to annihilate. Would it be like some sort of explosion, or would it be something that would take place over? some extended amount of time? I'm, I'm not sure. That's, a, that's an interesting question, yeah. You have any idea what kind of uh, energy uh, energy release per, per unit volume is sort of allowed and which one is sort of forbidden? Oh, I see. To make a quick estimate, huh? So um, I don't have the quantitative amount, but what I can tell you is that, so the, this limits on dark matter annihilation, it's a very, very, very tiny part, fraction of the dark matter that actually annihilates. So basically, to have a, to have an effect on this on the recombination, all you need is to release roughly thirteen point six electron volts per baryon. Thirteen, right? uh, 13 electron they volts are, per baryon. That just the ion, the ionization has the ionization energy per baryon. Ten to minus eight. Huh? Ten to ten to, order of ten to minus eight. So if you're exactly for a GeV dark matter, yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be worrying. Yeah. If if what? Sorry. If if you overshoot that. Then you should be worrying about limits. Huh? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. If you yeah. if you convert more than ten to minus eight of the, okay, so good, good. That's something good. like that. Yeah, as a really rough, uh, even less than this, because you just need to to modify the recombination history at the percent level. You know, so even if you have, uh, you know, one percent additional ionizing photons per baryon, 
So even even less than this should be so minus have eight, some effect. That's the rate delta m over m, right? Ten to minus eight of what is is what? So ten to the minus eight would over be the fractional period, right? over which period? This is, right. So a round recombination, a round recombination. You know, if you do this, if you do this way before redshift a thousand, it doesn't matter. If you do this. Uh, as we were discussing right now, if you do this at very late redshifts, uh, very late times, it doesn't matter. So you have to do it around redshift a thousand or so. And you have to release of the order of, yeah, 10 to the minus eight of the baryon rest mass okay. in energy into the plasma or 10 to minus nine even might be enough. Okay, thanks. Okay, so if no any uh, questions or comments, then let's thank the speaker again and all the speakers of this session.